Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wonderful privilege of being here at the International again tonight with your people. Thank you for the love of God that has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for Way International here and its outreach around <coughs> the nations of the world. And may this be a wonderful night for our people, all of our children, our young people, and our adults. And may we go forth this week holding forth the greatness and the integrity and the inherent accuracy of your word in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless. You may be seated. <coughs> How many of you in here for the first time tonight? Hold up your hand. Well, welcome to the place that has no strangers, according to Howard Allen. No strangers at the way. It was wonderful to have you. We have a whole delegation in here from New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut on Ambassador One. Hold up your hands. Look, right over here. <coughs> the purpose of all mankind, the reason that God made man and the things that he wants man to do is to live to the glory of his praise that we should live to the glory of God's praise. And tonight, Glad Tidings is going to sing a song for you called Give Glory to God. So, Glad Tidings. He gave to me life eternally can do is be thankful. He seated me high in the heavenlies. All I can do is be thankful. All I can do is be thankful. Don't you get down, get your feet on the ground. Turn it around and be thankful. God is alive, he's beside you, inside you. He loves you, he trusts you, he guides you. It's all up to you, what you do, he won't leave you. His son gave his life just to save you. So stand in the glorious grace of his calling. Give glory to God and be thankful. Give glory to God and be thankful. We are completely complete in Him. All we can do is be thankful. And it's victory over and over again. All we can do is be thankful. All we can do is be thankful. Don't you get down, get your feet on the ground. Turn it around and be thankful. God is alive, He's beside you, inside you. He loves you, He trusts you, He guides you. It's all up to you what you do, He won't leave you. His son gave His life just to save you. So stand in the glory, it's grace of His calling. Give glory to God and be thankful. Give glory to God and be thankful. Don't you get down, get your feet on the ground, turn it around and be thankful. God is alive, He's beside you, inside you. He loves you, He trusts you, He guides you. It's all up to you what you do, He won't leave you. His Son gave His life just to save you. So stand in the glorious grace of His calling. Give glory to God and be thankful. Give glory to God and be thankful. Give glory to God and be thankful. Each and every one of our lives is a glory to God as we walk with Him, as we walk in fellowship, as we walk in great desire to do the will of God. You know something? 
God will do absolutely anything for us to find out his will in every situation. All we have to do is ask him to open our eyes. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Savior divine. Open my ears and let me hear voices of truth thou sendest clear. And as the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Savior divine. Open my mouth and I may bear, bring your head and see. Truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare, love with thy children not to share.
want to grow you might like to know there's only one way to go ambassadors who's redeeming the time renewing their minds giving sight to the blind ambassadors if the world's gonna move we need someone to move it and it ain't gonna get done now if no one will do it but now spreading out all through our land ambassadors taking a stand his word will not fail you he promised just believe him and all will be well and then go to a world that is dying his perfect salvation to tell turn your eyes upon Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace to be free and who came along ambassadors would they listen close and then they gave me a dose of love and God's word ambassadors so you have the time won't you sign on the line decided to be an ambassador you've decided to be an ambassador well it's just a wonderful joy and a wonderful privilege to serve God and serve his people and I'm real thankful for his love and his grace and his mercy. And you just keep on praying for me and praying for our ministry because we sure need it. And I thank you for your love and your interest and your prayers. And it's real wonderful. Take your Bibles tonight and go to Luke chapter 8. Unbelief utters only words. It never utters the word. Does a lot of talking, uses a lot of words, but never gets to the word. Some of us have gone through experiences where we were taught like we should touch the radio as our point of contact or touch the television set or reach over and touch the individual next to you as your point of contact. Well, for those of us who love God and His Word, His Word is our point of contact with Him. Not some radios, not some TV. It's His Word. It is His Word that brings us to the place where we become utterly and completely one with Him. We become what that word says we are when we believe what that word says then we become utterly one with him i refer to it as union with jesus you see when this happens in the life of a man or a woman those weaknesses and those inabilities that men mankind is so acclimatized to seeing in christians those weaknesses and those inabilities, they just disappear. 
in the presence of God and by the strength of God as He reveals Himself in His Word. This little statement on the back here that is so well known by our people around the world which says that the Word of God is. First of all, you could stop it there and it'd be a revelation to most people. <laughs> for most people, the Word of God is a has-been. <laughs> but for us, the Word of God is. It's a present tense active verb now. And if any man ever wills to know the will of God, he has to come to the Word of God to get the will of God. Tonight I'd like to take you in to Luke chapter 8. And perhaps the reason that this thing is so burning in my heart tonight is because my heart and mind is gearing itself for the advanced class, which we'll be moving into tomorrow for three weeks. And one of the phases of the advanced class, of course, is the manifestation of healings. And we'll be dealing with that and we'll be covering all the different references in God's Word that deal with healing. The only way you can ever know the will of God regarding healing is you've got to go to the Word. And here in John, Luke 8 are a number of them, but the one I'd like to handle with you tonight and share with you it begins in verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border. The word border is the word hem. Just the border, we understand what that means. What to you is a border, a hem is a border, a border is a hem. Of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched, which means it dried up, it terminated. Here's a woman who has been very much afflicted for 12 years. And usually if you've been afflicted for any great length of time, like 12 years or one man 38 years in the Word, there's very little believing left that God is still able to do something. Here was this woman who had this sickness for 12 years. She had done everything she could, everything she knew how to do sense knowledge wise. She had not just sat around and prayed and done nothing. She had been praying, but she had also been acting, doing everything she could, and yet somehow or other she was not delivered because it said she could, neither could be healed of any or cured. Verse 4, 44, she came behind Jesus. She followed behind him. I don't know if I can picture this to you as vividly as I see it in the original text. There, there's a whole crowd, and she is coming behind him, and she's just pushing up through the crowd toward the front, and she wants to push in on him and yet not really do it. She wants to do it, and she doesn't want to do it. That's the text, you know, in action. She came behind. The word him in the King James is in italics. Well, if you're behind, you're behind him. Uh, that's axiomatic. But the, the depth of the word here is what intrigues me. Came behind and touched. And in order to touch, she had to reach out. She had to reach out just to touch. She came behind and she got to thinking, well, what, 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 wonder what he'll say if, if, if I just touch. Just touch. You know, she didn't put both hands off on him and jerk off his gown. Right. That's right. Because first of all, she was a woman. And in that culture at that time, this was a real bold move on a woman's part. A real bold move. Because 
the woman doesn't come to the front. She always stays behind. Have you noticed in, in pictures of, that you've seen in the Far East, the man always walks ahead of the woman. They don't, you know, drag each other along like we do in America. Poor old woman hangs on and you've got to pull her along. <laughs> in the Far East, they got women that are women. They follow along behind, you know, on their own strength, I guess. But anyways, bless your heart, I like you. <laughs> For this woman to break culture, and that's what she's doing, is really fantastic. She literally broke the culture because she was a woman. The men would follow the women, come behind, way behind. You know, if you had, like this group tonight, the men, if I went for a walk, then all the men walk right behind me, and then behind the men come all the women. Now, this woman got up toward the front, and I want to tell you, I'll bet that took a little boldness. You know why? I can see those men. There's a woman coming up here. <laughs> Did you see that? Did you see that woman? That's what I see in the word. She got right up there, and that's why came behind. You know, she finally made it right up there in the front line with the men right at the front, and then she just said, Oh my God, me. People, when your need gets big enough, when it gets big enough, your need gets big enough and your want gets lined up with it, you're going to do anything that has to be done if you have to break every cultural rule in the world because God is more important than tradition and culture is nothing but tradition. God is more important than anything men ever say about him. <laughs> That's right. No man can say anything better about God than what God says about himself in his word. No man ever improves upon the word. The best man ever does is to equal what the word says, but usually men do less than what the word says when they present it. They usually water it down. This woman broke all culture, and she got right behind Jesus, and she reached out, she reached out, and she just touched the hem of his garment. Boy, what a woman. You see, it's hard for us in the Occident to understand this because ordinarily, you know, we in the Occident will run up and a woman will run up and say, hey, hug me. Well, you don't do that down here. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't run up to Jesus and say, hug me. Da, da, da. I tell you, even to press way up there and then just to reach out and just touch the hem of his garment was a fantastic act of believing. Boy, there are very few of us in the Occident that understand these things because we don't understand the, the order and the tradition and the culture of it of that time. Quite a bold woman. But that woman had a fantastic need. Twelve years she'd been suffering like crazy. And here was the one about whom she'd been hearing. I don't know, maybe she had been following in the crowd previously as he ministered those records that talk about are talked about here in the Gospel of Luke. Maybe she saw these things and her believing was built up that here is the man of God. Here is someone whom I believe can really help me. And she got so bold, she came all the way to the front, and then she just reached out and just touched the hem of his garment. And the moment she touched it, Jesus didn't minister to her. Jesus didn't pray for her. Jesus didn't put her under a psychiatric probe. Jesus didn't do one blessed thing, people. Isn't that fantastic? Immediately, what does it say? Her issue 
her problem with her blood situation was terminated, dried up, staunch, terminated, healed. This is the case that I would like to refer to as stealing your healing. <laughs> something, isn't it? You know, she never said to him, may I please touch the hem of your garment? No, she just walked up and claimed what I today know in our administration as legal sonship rights. She just walked up and she believed, she believed that if she could but touch the hem of his garment, she'd be made whole. Boy, what a principle. What a principle of believing. She believed if she could just touch the hem. She didn't even believe that he had to pray for her. Today I have people come to me, and this happened to me at the heartbeat last weekend. They said, well, Dr. Rivell, I think if you'll pray for me, I'll be healed. Well, if you got your believing there, then I have to do it. But what are you going to do if I'm not around and you're sick? You see, there's no more strength within me than there is within you. For the same Christ that lives within me is the same Christ that lives within you. And God so made the body of the church that each believer could help every other believer when they had need. But we've got to build our believing upon the integrity and accuracy of God's Word and not upon an individual. That's why I'm so blessed many times being gone from here. It isn't that I don't like you. It isn't that I wouldn't like to be home a little more here at headquarters. But you know something? When I come home, the place is still here. And when I'm not here on Sunday night, the Word of God lives here, and our people come by the barrel full, just like you tonight. All of you up here, all of you down, giving us the foundation underneath us here. You come on Sunday night, Every Sunday night, the place is filled because people come hear the Word. So it isn't that V.P. Werwell's here to teach the Word. It's the fact the Word's here. That's what's important. That's right. It's not important who teaches it. It's important what is taught. And if you hold forth the Word, it's as much the Word as when I hold it for it. This woman was so fantastic, people. She was so absolutely convinced that he did not even have to minister to her. He didn't even have to pray for her. He didn't even have to put any mud on her sores, anything. She just reached out believing if she could just touch the hem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's no healing in the hem of a garment. Go and touch yours. That's right. That's right. There is no healing in the aprons of Paul. They took from his body, what was it? Apron and uh, handkerchiefs? Acts, isn't it? And people were healed. There's no healing in a handkerchief. There's no healing in an apron. Then why did they get healed? Believing. And let's put it another way. I'll set it for you completely as I understand it. In the Oriental culture, they believed that whatever a real man of God wore, that that which they, that man wore was a blessing if you could even touch it. That's what they believed. That's why this woman just reached out, sir, just to touch his hem. Isn't that beautiful? We have people today and say, Oh, my, if I could just see a big miracle, I'd believe. Or if I could just be with Dr. Irwell and travel with him for three weeks, wouldn't that be heaven? Oh, Lord, don't you ever try it. <laughs> ah, we'd both be miserable. <laughs> you breathing down my neck and waiting. Well, people, it's in the believing. And the believing is built upon the integrity of God's Word. Is God's Word true or is it not? You know, in the foundational class, we do hit John 10, 10, remember? 
Is it true or isn't it true? Is Corinthians true or isn't it true? Is Galatians true or isn't it true? You just got to make up your mind whether the Word of God's true or not true. Now, I'm not talking about King James, but if I'm using King James, if you got anything better, bring it on. I'm ready to see it. I'm still talking about the Word of God. I know that everything in King James is not accurate, but what I, whatever you'll bring along is basically more inaccurate than King James. In you know, if King James has ac places in it that's not quite so accurate, let's say a thousand, every other translation that I've read has two thousand in it. So when I talk about the Word of God, I'm not speaking about a translation. I'm speaking about that word that fits like a hand in a glove, that word that just works all the way through, that you work and work the texts until they fit without you squeezing them. Then you're back to that original word that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that is God's word. And God's word is absolutely God's will. You just got to make up your mind whether you believe it is. This woman believed. She believed so utterly that she broke all the culture. She broke through the men came up to the front and finally reached down and just touched the hem of his garment. The healing was in the believing that if she could but touch the hem of the garment of this wonderful man, she'd be healed. She'd be healed. Well, she was. It says immediately. And you know what immediately means? That's what it means. Right away, booms quick, now. Ganschka <laughs> Swint. That's German. Now, immediately, <laughs> immediately, it's a miracle of healing. And verse 45, Jesus said, Who touched me? Man, oh man. <laughs> Who touched me? Jesus said, Hey, wait a minute. If he'd have been God, he wouldn't have to ask a stupid question like that. Because God knows all, you know. Oh, we got problems, don't we? You got them. I haven't got them. You got them, not me. That's right. That's right. If you got any. Hey, but isn't that beautiful? He didn't know, but he knew something had happened. Something had happened. You know how I know he knew? By revelation. God showed him something had happened. He felt something had in his body. Really something. And then comes along this beautiful fellow known Peter. All of them denied. Everyone denied. They said, oh, nobody touched you, Master. We're just going along with you as a gang. Right. When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, well, Master, it's a very logical thing, very simple. There's a whole multitude here, and the multitude throng thee, and the newspaper gang is here, the press. <laughs> You know, they always crowd you in. <laughs> Doesn't God have a wonderful sense of humor, or somebody does? I don't know. <laughs> that Peter, he's always a sharpie, isn't he? He's always right there. Always wrong, but he's always there. <laughs> you know, that fella, the only time he ever got his foot out of his mouth was when he changed feet throughout the Gospels. That's right. <laughs> And, and what Peter was logical as crazy, wasn't he? He was right on. The logic of Peter's argument is absolutely fantastic. He could have been a professor in logic in any institution in the United States. His logic is good. Still dead wrong. <laughs> right. Jesus said, who touched me? Peter said, very simple. A whole crowd around. Anybody, any one of any, a whole bunch of people could touch you. Jesus said, don't kid me. Somebody touched me. Now you begin to see why I like that great song, He Touched Me. We sang it, I think, this morning, didn't we, a 1030 trip? He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And that's terrific. I mean, it's a takeoff off of this. Because people, when you reach out to touch him, he will automatically and spiritually touch you. 
Jesus said, somebody hath touched me. Why? Because I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And I think the word virtue, if you have your any interlinear stuff or any Greek text, is the word dynamis. Dynamis. Dynamis is inherent power. It's potential power. But it is that power latent within that has to be there before it can bless people on the outside. You can't give anything away if you haven't got it. That's axiomatic. If you want to communicate the measles, get a case of them. Right. And the nicer case you have, the more maybe you can communicate. And if you don't like the measles, you want to communicate the seven-year itch, get the seven-year itch. Communicate it. Well, Jesus said he had perceived what? Virtue, dynamis, that inherent power within him had gone out. It's gone out. He got revelation. He knew something had happened. And when the woman, S-A-W, saw, S-A-W, saw that she was not hid, and I see this thing very beautifully. It's so simple. Jesus turned around. I'm supposed to stay in front of the microphone, but I ain't going to do it. <laughs> Here, Jesus turned around like I'm turned to you. Only he was standing close to everybody, and he had been walking like this, and others over here aside of him. And all at once he turned around, and he said, Who touched me? And Peter said, nobody could have done, you know, nobody in particular. The whole gang's around. And then those words, when the woman saw, you know what happened? Jesus looked right at her. That's what happened. He looked right at her, and she knew that he knew that she had been the one who touched the hem. That's why she came trembling, what's it say? She came trembling, falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. How she was healed. She told right now. Jesus saw by revelation who had touched him, but he did not know why. She came and told him why? What you can know by your sense knowledge, you don't need revelation for. Isn't that beautiful? She just told him, and she came trembling. One of the reasons she came trembling was not because of a negative fear, but of the excitement of the moment, the time. I do not believe that she was full of fear. But have you put yourself in the same boat? If you've ever really been sick and you got delivered, you might tremble just from the joy and rejoicing in your heart. Shoot, you know, in the days when I played basketball, I never started a game that I wasn't what the world calls nervous, trembling. Wasn't because I was afraid, but I just like a racehorse, ready to go. That's right. I never walk into this place on a Sunday night, and this is, the, to me, the greatest teaching center in the world. Of course, I'm prejudiced, so discounted 50 percent, still the greatest. <laughs> you see, I never walk in here that I'm not excited. Never. Because, you know, I'm not what I call nervous, but I want to tell you, I'm not as cool as a cucumber frozen in the middle of December either, you know. I'm hot. I'm ready to go. Well, I think that's the woman. She had gotten delivered. I wouldn't have surprised me a bit if she was crying her eyeballs out. And uh, one fellow got healed once, and he jumped around like a shouting Pentecostal or something. <laughs> Try. He was leaping and praising who? Yeah. And boy, this was in a real sedate. Jewish background Israel type of synagogue place. You just don't do things like that. Temple. Right. 
this woman came falling down before him she declared unto him before all the people for what cause why she had reached out to touch him and how she was healed and Jesus said he said unto her daughter isn't that beautiful you talk about the tenderness of Christ again fantastic Peter wasn't quite that tender yet Peter was simply saying look master they're pressing anybody could Jesus said to this beautiful woman he said daughter and you know what the word daughter means the same as the word son means when it's used in the Gospels means that she belonged to the household of that great wonderful fellowship of the saints that are called out of Israel a woman a daughter of Abraham like the Syrophoenician woman this woman was a daughter a believer be of good comfort are omitted in all the text not in the text and of course because it is here I think it's not too bad because I see her just really excited and you know just even just thanking the Lord within her heart and he says look honey it's beautiful you're sweet you're wonderful cool it just have a good time be of good comfort yeah then comes this tremendous ver the phrase thy faith hath made thee whole go in peace it's really something daughter thy faith hath made thee whole this word faith is the one that needs to be clarified because I have just consistently used the word believing and I have said all the period of time I've been teaching or regarding this that this woman believed it was her believing when she touched the what him it was her believing now here we have the word faith Those two words are not identical. Faith is a spiritual inside job. Believing is of the mind, or as the Bible says at times, of the heart. That doesn't mean the physical heart, but the renewed mind that is so completely renewed on it that with every fiber of their being they just know it's true. In our research and teaching ministry, this word, believing, faith, the word, this section or these sections in the word caused us a few years of work. This summer, I'm going to do a week at Camp Gunnison with our people on just working the word Pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. That's the Greek word. It is translated faith. It's also translated believing or to believe. And I'm going to spend all week with our people and we're going through every verse in the Scripture again because we're just about ready to publish the work. And we'll go through it once more and then by God's mercy and grace will publish it and make it available to our people. But if you'll keep your finger in Luke, I'm coming back, you go to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 23. But before faith came, 
before what? Faith came. Then there must have been a time when there was no what? Faith. That's right. There was a time when there was no faith, but there has never been a time when men could not believe. Because the natural man of body and soul, can he believe? Otherwise he could not be born again. The natural man of body and soul does not have faith. He has the ability to believe. Let's say I'm a natural man of body and soul and you teach me God's Word. Now once I hear it, I have the ability and the freedom to either accept it or reject it, which means I can either believe it or not believe it, right? So the human mind has the ability to believe, but the human mind does not have faith. Faith's an inside job. There was a time before faith came. Now, I don't tell you exactly when it was if you just read what's written. We were kept under the what? Law. Shut up. Closed off. Unto the faith. Which should afterwards, after what? The law. After the fulfillment of the law, be what? Revealed. That's that verse. Very simple. Look at it again. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up or closed off unto the faith, which should afterwards, after the law, be revealed. Some place, I think it's in Romans, isn't it, where it says that Christ is the end of the law, or some place. He's the fulfillment of it. Before faith came, we were kept under the what? The law. Afterwards, after its fulfillment, afterwards be what? Revealed. Verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. The law was not faith. The law was a what? Schoolmaster. To bring us is in italics. Scratch it. The law never brought anybody to Christ. The only thing the law ever did is brought you a headache. The b law made you conscious of sin. That's right. Without the law, the Scripture said there'd be no awareness or knowledge of transgression. The law was the schoolmaster the teacher until or unto whom? Christ. That we might be justified by faith. Pistis. Verse 25. Now watch it carefully. But in contrast, after that faith is come, we are still under the law. After that faith is come, we are no longer under a what? Schoolmaster. And how many of us have not endeavored to live under something that wasn't available to us? But everybody worked on us to tell us it was our responsibility to be under it. Pretty something. You see, when you practice the law of life, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the great law of love, you don't need the Ten Commandments. That's right. Christ is the end of the law. He was the fulfillment of it. And after that faith came, which came with Jesus Christ, He's the one who made it available. After that faith has come, we are no longer under a what? Schoolmaster. You're no longer under the law. You 
are living in a higher realm of spiritual adaptation to the greatness of the power of God and His Word. Isn't that wonderful? That's right. This is why faith came with Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual job. When you're born again of God's Spirit, you have Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one you have. Christ is in you. People used to say to me, they wish they had my faith. You've got the same amount I got. That's right. If it's Christ in you, then you have the same power, sir, in you that I have, because I do not have any more of Christ than you have. Believing varies among people who are Christian, but faith does not vary. God has given to every man, the Scripture says, the measure of faith, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's all wrapped up in that spiritual package. The same amount of faith I have, you have. The difference, then, is not in faith, it's in believing. If you believe God's Word and I don't, you get the results of your believing. I get the consequences of my unbelief. That's why there's a difference. Now this woman in Luke 9, Jesus said unto her, Daughter, thy pistis, thy what? It can't be faith. It has to be what? Believing, because Christ had not yet fulfilled what I read to you from Galatians. Christ came to make the new birth available. If any one person could be born again before it was completely complete, then everybody could be born again before it was complete, then Jesus Christ would not need it to have died, and God would not need it, sir, to have resurrected him. Faith was not available until Jesus Christ had completed everything, and his completion was not just with his death, but with his resurrection, with his ascension. And eight days later, when God Send forth this which ye now see and hear that Acts talks about. So if this Word of God is to be handled accurately, the text reads, Daughter, thy believing hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Go in peace. Isn't that beautiful? Her believing had made her whole. There were ten lepers came to Jesus. All ten were healed. Only one, the Bible says, was made whole. So to be made whole, people, it means more biblically than just to get healed. That's right. Sir, to be made whole is to really get it together in life. To be mentally sound, physically sound, spiritually whole, financially whole. This woman had spent all that she had. Jesus said, Woman, you're believing. Your believing has made you what? Whole. And then he said, Quit stewing about it. Just go in what? Peace. What a record. You see, God's Word, with your believing, dominates circumstances. And we have to be Word-conditioned rather than world-conditioned. And when this is true of our individual lives, then you and I are God's will in the adversary's world, and we take the place 
of Jesus Christ here upon earth acting in his stead. That's power of attorney, legally, which he has given to every believer. Jesus Christ is not upon the earth now. The Bible said God resurrected him, raised him, he ascended, and he sat down at the right hand of us. And from thence he is coming back. He is not here now in all the, the effulgence, the beauty, the dynamic that we shall someday see. He is here now by what God wrapped up in that new birth of Christ in you, which is the faith of Jesus Christ, the love, the peace, the joy, all of that. But He is living within you spiritually. That's where He is. Christ in you. You and I have to take the place this week, right now, of Jesus Christ here upon earth, and we have to act in His stead. Jesus said, The works that I do, ye shall what? He said to the woman, Daughter, your believing hath made you whole. Go in peace. If Jesus can say that to people, then I, as God's Son, born again of God's Spirit, I can say to you, God bless you. And I think for most people, they think that's just a flip of the lip. Not for me. Not for me. It is the blessing of God. It's the power of God moving upon an individual. When I say to you, well, God bless you. Jesus said to the woman, go in what? Peace. When you, you know, they make fun about us sometimes, the unbelievers. They say, we always, people always say, bless you, bless you, bless you. Well, that's a, excuse me, damn sight better than saying a lot of other things I hear. <laughs> Try. And you know, the only people get irritated being blessed by God have to be the people ought to get born again. Or something ought to happen to them. It doesn't bother me when you say, God bless you. Or when you say, me, say to me, Jesus Christ loves you. That doesn't bother me. But I suppose if I was a rank unbeliever, I wouldn't like it. Or if I was born of the wrong seed, I'd hate it very viciously. <laughs> Jesus said, Daughter, go in what? Peace. Look at the tremendous truth in that. She no longer had to stew and fret about getting this problem all over again and being worried. I wonder how long this will hold good. Or I wonder if I get the issue back tomorrow morning. Jesus just quieted her beautiful heart and said, go in what? And that's what we need to do as God's people. We got to bless each other. We got to just quietly but dynamically put the peace of God, the love of God, the joy of God on people. That's right. You just go around and say, Well, God bless you this week. If they say you're freaky, you say, So what? A difference make what they say. You know, if they call you a peanut, they don't make you different. <laughs> you know, sit you know, I can stay in there all day and call that rose an elephant. That's not going to make it an elephant. See? So if they call you freaky, that doesn't make you freaky. Maybe they're the freaky ones, see. No more so than putting a wheelbarrow in a garage makes a Cadillac out of it. How's that? <laughs> I'm glad your sense of humor is good. I don't know any better way to teach it. I don't know any other way to teach it. You just have to sometime feel this thing in your bones like it's written. You have to feel it throughout your whole being. That he should say to her, Woman, don't stew any longer. Don't even be concerned about it ever coming. Don't mess. You know, you've spent everything. Don't worry about it. Just go in peace. Daughter, you've got it. Go in peace. 
The Word of God says that those of us who are born again of God's Spirit were to be especially good to the household of faith. Remember that? It's in there. Especially good. Now, I can afford to be good to a lot of people, but I have to be especially good to the household of faith. And you know who the household of faith is? The gang that's born again of God's Spirit who has the faith of what? Jesus Christ. To those, I have to be especially good. So do you. So let's have an especially good week among the believers. How's that? Wonderful. Thank you, Father, for the greatness of your word. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your goodness. Thank you for your blessing on our lives and for all your wonderful presence and power with us in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to take this opportunity to again thank you who came on Ambassador One for accepting our invitation to International for the weekend. Also want to thank all the rest of you beautiful saints for coming in here again on this wonderful Sunday night to be a part of this ministry and fellowship as it reaches around the world. Real grateful and real thankful for all of you. And I'll make a deal with you. I won't forget you in prayer. Don't you forget me, okay? And our ministry. I'm real thankful. It's been a joy having all of you tonight. I'm real thankful to God for the privilege of being at International with you.